All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone to our webinar on unlocking the business value of communities of practice. My name is Carrie Coos. I'm a senior product marketing manager here at Stack Overflow, and we are so excited to have you join us today. Before we begin, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items for us. So first of all, today's session is being recorded and we will share the recording with you in the coming days. So keep an eye out for that. Next, um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see a set of engagement tools. Um, so let's go over those quickly. Uh, the first tab is the chat function. Um, and I'd love to go ahead and test it out. So if you want to go ahead and drop it into the chat where you are joining us from today. Ooh. Wisconsin, Georgia, California. Oh, we see UK, Poland. Awesome. Okay, we're get, we're going global here. Great. Um, all right, next up, if you have a question for us today, go ahead and navigate to the Q&A tab and enter your questions there. Uh, you may not see them appear immediately, and if there are any we don't get to in today's session, we will do our best to follow up with those answers. And if you see a question that somebody else submitted that you also have, you can use the thumbs up feature to increase that question's priority. Next, we have a docs tab, which you'll find the helpful resources regarding today's session. And we'll, we will also be sending them out after the webinar. We also have closed captioning available. Um, so to activate that, you can hover over the uh, video screen and click on the CC icon. And we have offered a few language translation options with plans to add more languages in the future. And finally, if you are running into any technical issues, you can click on that gear icon on the bottom of the page. And under questions, you can click on help docs. And with that, let's go ahead and dive in. As mentioned, my name is Carrie, and I am joining you from Denver, Colorado. Happy to be here um, and really thrilled to have my colleague Jonathan joining us today. Um, Jonathan, why don't you introduce yourself and let us know where you're joining from? Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Jonathan Click. I am a solutions engineer joining you from New Hampshire. Uh, just for the record, that picture there is a false representation. I am way less professional looking in person. Uh, but anyway, I'm happy to talk to you today a bit about technical communities and, and how they apply and how we're going to help you through our proc to, do, to achieve that. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, so um, today we are going to be talking about communities and their value for businesses, starting with a little bit of a background on Stack Overflow's own journey to building technical communities online. Then we will talk about what are communities, why they matter, um, what challenges are they helping solve for businesses, followed by a preview into the communities feature on Stack Overflow for Teams. So to begin, I want us to step into a time machine together. The year is 2008. Barack Obama is elected the first African-American president. The iPhone had its first birthday and the first iPod touch has been released. The housing market has crashed and we are in a great recession. The Tesla Roadster electric vehicle first hits the streets and the internet of things is born. Um, importantly, Britney Spears is making her big comeback. And it's also the year I personally joined Twitter. Um, and since I was still rocking a Motorola Razor at the time, I actually had to send a text with my tweets to a special number uh, to actually tweet for me on my behalf if I wanted to tweet anything while I was not actually at a computer. Um, so, as you can see, the internet and the tools for using it uh, looked a lot different back then. And this is especially true for programmers. If you were learning to code or coding professionally, it was difficult to share knowledge and solve problems with other programmers online. Forums were clunky and hard to navigate. Some even charged a premium fee to use and ultimately failed because of this strategy uh, because, well, Many of the folks looking for programming knowledge online were not typically the ones who would be able to pay for access to a community, and nor should they. Uh, so in 2008, there 
wasn't a single space for these programmers to gather, share, learn, and become better together until Stack Overflow. And the founders of Stack Overflow saw an opportunity to build the library of program and knowledge by leveraging the many programmers online, looking for answers and leveraging those with expertise to share. Uh, in the words of one of our founders, we created Stack Overflow because the internet sucked for programmers and we needed to make it better. So Stack actually, Overflow Carrie, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, Carrie, but like you're in marketing. If I put in a feature request, could we make that our company slogan, make the internet suck less for programmers? I could picture that on billboards or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I will get right on that right after this. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> Love that. Um, yeah. So you can see our goals, build the definitive library of programming knowledge and make the internet suck less. Um, so yeah, so Stack Overflow did become a place where programmers could ask and answer questions about programming online and everything about the format and setup was by design to make our scale and impact as wide as possible to help the most people. Uh, so this meant you know, the simple Q&A format that we're familiar with where people can ask and answer questions asynchronously and in a transactional way, gradually building that library of knowledge where developers could go back to again and again and continuing to build on that collective knowledge with new questions and answers. Uh, so what has changed in the last 15 years since 2008? Well, a lot. Uh, not only can you tweet straight from the little computer in your pocket without sending a, an extra text message, but there's been an explosion of content and media that's now easily available to us. We can read blogs, watch videos, listen to podcasts, all of these different um, forms of, of media to help us learn. And sorting through all of this content, while it's amazing, takes a lot of time. And the sheer number of technologies and the pace at which they're changing is exciting, but it can feel impossible to keep up with. There's also been a massive increase in the number of technical roles and even what we would call technology adjacent roles. So those working closely with technology, even if their work isn't specifically technical in nature. Uh, and with that comes an increased mix of backgrounds and experiences. And technology, is an integral part of our daily lives, even for those who would never call themselves a technologist. And as technology and the people using it change, our needs for learning change too. So Stack Overflow looked at how can we continue to enable our technical communities uh, to develop technology through this collective knowledge. Uh, and we identified three main areas where we have an opportunity to continue to make a great impact. Um, first is enabling more domains to emerge. Second, broaden the types of content and ways for the community to practice skills. And third is expanding community roles to provide more ways for people to engage and have a sense of belonging. So looking back, what's always been true about building communities? Well, communities have been an inherent part of the human experience from the earliest of times and continue to be integral even in or especially in the age of remote and distributed teams. But what may also be equally inherent to the human experience is our desire to share what we know and help others learn that too. And this is what keeps our communities going. And it's something that Stack Overflow really relied on to make the site even work. It was something that became known as the quote, miracle in the steps after building and launching the site. Our founders knew they could build and launch this thing called Stack Overflow, but they didn't have a guarantee that people would willingly spend their time sharing knowledge for fake internet points. But it turns out people really do want to help each other learn. And as they give to a community, they also receive and that cycle continues. And as we learn and find more effective ways to learn, we can be more efficient and productive, which is something we can all agree on is a, a desire for us. Um, and it feels good to be acknowledged for our contributions, especially at work, which in incentivizes further contribution. And 
as more programmers, then more technologists, and eventually all sorts of people from all backgrounds came to Stack Overflow and our Stack Exchange sites, we didn't just build a community of collective knowledge. We actually built a community of people who trusted each other to help them learn and solve problems. And uh, with that, I'm going to toss it over to Jonathan. Hey, everyone. Um, so let me talk to you a bit first. Uh, before we talk about the community's feature, I, I think it's a, important to talk a little bit about its precursor collectives because it's a bit of a case study within itself that really demonstrates kind of why we're doing this and, and, and the value we're looking to provide. So if I go ahead and share my screen real quick, let's see here. I believe this is the one. So, I mean, if you go to the public site today, for example, and you look, it's a very large community. I mean, we've got like 23 million, close to 24 million questions, 100 million users and so forth. And while we discovered that most everyone used Stack Overflow as a learning resource, only 58% actually consider themselves to be a part of the Stack Overflow community per se. And maybe that doesn't come as a surprise. Being one person among a million people is loosely unified through tags might not give you necessarily a sense of community or belonging. So we wanted to create a space for like-minded individuals to organize and collaborate around a specific domain within the platform. And this is where we introduce this topic of collectives. And so you could come in here and we've been rolling these out if you're not already aware of them. And we've got Google Cloud, any GCP people out there, um, you know, and you can come into this and you'll notice that rather than like 70,000 tags, it's got 185 that are very focused on a specific domain. And when we did this, we found that people felt a deeper sense of identity of responsibility and ownership for their peers in the community, as well as maintaining and curate, curating the content that, in that community. Uh, and in fact, if I go ahead and uh, leave this, stop sharing this for a second and flip over to my slides, uh, one of the key observations we made here was that we saw a 30% increase in engagement. And when we saw this as an outcome, we wanted to bring the same experience to technical organizations who use our Stack Overflow for Teams product. And for those of you on the call who might be like leaders or managers, you might already realize that the value of engagement for staff members is high. Because as engagement increases, those staff members get more value. And as their value increases, their engagement further increases. And again, we really wanted to make sure that our Stack Overflow for Teams product got that same sort of thing. In particular, um, when, we, when, when companies grow and scale their technology organizations, they often encounter many of the same challenges. For example, knowledge silos. Um, knowledge silos, 68% of developers say they encounter a knowledge silo once a week. 44% of them say they occasionally or frequently made a wrong decision because they didn't have the information they needed. Productivity challenges. 50% of developers say that productivity contributes to their happiness at work. How about redundancy of work? 49% of developers report that they find themselves answering questions they've answered before. And as technologists, that's like it goes pretty, against pretty much everything we believe in. I mean, classic software development principle, don't repeat yourself, right? Uh, and this also ties back to what we just talked about, which is that about productivity and how productivity leads to happiness. Um, when we think about creating growth opportunities within organizations, 50% of developers within your organizations want opportunities to learn at work. That contributes to their happiness as well. Uh, and then last but not least, distributed teams. I mean, we've got people who are remote first, hybrid, multiple offices, people who are distributed across the globe. Uh, but this also contributes back to the first challenge, which is knowledge silos. And we feel an important part of the solution in helping our customers to, uh, to be successful in these areas and to <laughs> overcome these challenges is really about building successful communities of practice. Um, so when we think about communities of practice, I, I really like this definition that, that, I, that we've encountered here, which is called, where it says, groups of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. 
And in fact, Gartner, uh, that's not on, I don't have a slide for this, unfortunately. I came across this quote I really liked. It said, many IT organizations continue to rely on top-down, functionally aligned centers of excellence that focus on policy adherence and governance instead of problem solving and learning. And in contrast, communities of practice are motivational if they provide a clear vision in space for the community to collaborate, learn, and evolve. And actually, if we were to go ahead and, and, and look at this the right way, this is actually a little bit retro. Uh, back in the Middle Ages, we had guilds. And, and think of, if you think about what the primary purposes of guilds were, this probably sounds a little bit familiar to our tech organizations. It was to help people develop and adopt best practices for a given trade. It was about helping people to learn the trade, to progress from apprentice to journeyman to master, and that eventually masters became oftentimes inspectors to ensure that the quality of the work of other guild members was at a certain high standard. Sounds familiar, right? Um, and so um, bringing this back full circle, communities of practice are oftentimes very synonymous with the idea of a guild, and we're excited to help customers in this endeavor, and I apologize. I, I think we're officially done now with the history lessons, so you can all wake up now, and we'll go ahead and continue on. So uh, recently, uh, Stack Overflow was named as a, as a vendor in the Gartner hype cycle for agile and, and DevOps communities of practice. And besides the recognition they gave us, that's all nice and good and stuff like that. I think one of the greatest takeaways is that Gartner provide a bit of a framework for thinking about the core criteria to build the most impactful and collaborative groups. In particular, Gartner's focus wasn't just about building groups or communities, it was about building groups that are based on outcomes rather than output. And as a part of this concept, uh, let me walk you through those real quick. So one part was the domain, and you would imagine this is kind of a central component. Uh, the idea that this group share, has a shared interest like a skill, a project, an identity that creates value and purpose for a group. Uh, the idea of practice or the application of knowledge which drives expertise and innovation. And then also the idea of community where the group of like-minded individuals choose to come together. And communities of practice lies at the intersection of all of these. And I know this is a lot of preamble, but I, I can't emphasize enough. Some of you might have communities of practice and maybe you're leveraging them, them well. Maybe you're not. Maybe this is something you guys want to do or you folks want to do. Uh, but like, I think this is really foundational to, again, what we're gonna talk about now, which is communities, which is the newest feature in the Stack Overflow for Teams Enterprise Plan. Um, and in it's fact, honestly, if we, and, yep. and before we dive into the feature, I just, I know we have some questions regarding best practices of communities of practice. So would now be a good time to touch on that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so if we were thinking about best practices, actually, if any of you in channel even have like your own best practices or things not to do, uh, I, it'd be, it would be great to share them as well. Uh, I, I think when I think about the communities of practice, um, and, and, and best practices around that. That's a, the word practice a lot. I, I think some of the things I encounter when I'm working with customers, uh, one is simply awareness. Can we, can we promote the awareness that such a community of practice exists? Because oftentimes when we think about guilds or communities of practice, it's about bringing in people across many different parts of an organization who have those similar interests. And sometimes a, raising that awareness across a large organization is hard to do. Uh, it's something that I'll probably talk a bit about when we talk about the feature within the product as well. Uh, another key component that comes to mind is open access. Uh, sometimes I see that uh, having access to a community of practice or a guild uh, restricts, it's, it's sometimes restricted, uh, and that sometimes it's attached to corporate hierarchies, and those sorts of things can also inhibit the effectiveness I think last but not least, uh, another key thing that comes to mind, I'm sure there's other things that you guys could probably, or you folks could think of, but one of these would be also just having a dedicated central space where those people can congregate. Uh, and of course, like sometimes chat channels in Slack or Microsoft Teams, for example, can uh, help to achieve that. And of course, I'm going to tell you that Stack Overflow for Teams is your best bet. Uh, but I think overall the key is to just make sure 
that it also feels like a safe place. Because uh, people need a place when they're trying to learn and they're trying to practice and they're trying to experiment uh, that's kind of free of judgment and criticism to a degree so that they can have that opportunity to explore. Those are definitely some areas that come to mind. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. So let's talk about communities. Um, I think, by the way, the fact that we named the future, the future communities makes me really happy because if we named it communities of practice, I'd probably be out of breath by the end of this presentation. So I'm very grateful that we truncated it to just communities. Um, but anyway, the idea behind communities inside of our product, they're self-organizing groups. Uh, I talked a woman ago when I was talking about best practice around com uh, communities of practice and whatnot about open access, we very much fall on that theme and how we're, how we've implemented this is about self-organizing groups where people can openly join these groups and participate from around the organization. Uh, I'm a solutions engineer at Stack Overflow. I am not a data science expert, for example, but if I wanted to join a data science community because I wanted to get better in that area, there, I, I shouldn't be prevented from being able to do that. Um, communities are also especially valuable to working in specific domains. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of the examples here that, that come to mind, you've already you had this slide burned into your retinas, uh, is, is, for example, specialized collaboration, affinity groups, onboarding. Onboarding is a great one, by the way. That's not just about like onboarding new hires or maybe even onboarding junior devs or junior technologists. The reality is we're pretty much always onboarding. Uh, you know, if you have any sort of transformation in your organization where you're moving to cloud or you're moving to DevOps or things like that, you're now onboarding, even if you've been at the company for 10 years. Uh, but there's all sorts of other valuable ways, as you can see here, in which you can kind of create communities. Um, and so I guess one of the questions that might be on your minds, though, is don't we already have a lot of ways in Stack Overflow for Teams to kind of group people and content? And the answer is yes. But the, the deeper question is, how does communities for teams fit in? And does it fill important gaps? And the answer, of course, is yes, because of because of course I'm presenting and I, I set I staged that for myself. But like when we think about the current layout of how Stack Overflow for Teams operates today, you've got grouping of content, and content is done through tags and collections. That has not changed. And in fact, ironically, a lot of times when we traditionally would think of maybe building communities of practice within the constructs that Stack Overflow for Teams allows, a lot of times tags was the avenue. So you might have a data science tag, for example. Um, but one of the problems or challenges with that is that sometimes like if I wanted to build a community around front end development, well, that's many different tags. That's CSS, that's JavaScript, that's a lot of other things. And so individual tags wouldn't necessarily satisfy that. Additionally, however, uh, for those of you who are, again, who are using the enterprise plan, you might have access to private teams. Private teams are very much closed. It's like I have a area where we can't talk about these things at a broader level, whether it's a top secret project or it's knowledge that isn't freely available to a large audience, the broader Stack Overflow group. And I need to have an area where I can do this and have a closed group and or user groups which some of you might be leveraging, where user groups are basically departmental, organizational things where I can now mention a group of people or a team within the context of a question or permissions or otherwise, where, where communities really kind of fits in in comparison to all of that. Let me give you an example of this, actually. Um, a generative AI community. You all have gen AI initiatives now, right? Uh, any, anybody who doesn't? Uh, but like if we go at, or maybe even a community of front end developers, like I was talking about, those topics transcend an individual tag. These topics also aren't private. These are things that you want to generally keep open and transparent and allow other people to contribute, participate, search for that knowledge and whatnot. That's not ideal for a private team. And then likewise, a lot of times these sorts of topics of communities of practice and guilds isn't isolated to a certain group or department. We need a way to be able to kind of create that cross-sectional group 
in that that in that in that community as well. Kind of when we think back to like the the the, the public site community where we had like a hundred million users, and we needed to create a group that maybe had ten thousand or forty thousand people. Very similarly, in your organizations, rather than hundreds or thousands of people in a community, you might want to have a community that's more focused on a very specific domain, like the ones we're describing. So let's go ahead and give you a, a quick tour of what that looks like. And, uh, and hopefully this helps you to kind of see how this will fit in. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions, commentary, concerns, objections, whatever you'd like to throw at me. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing again real quick and reshare. All right, if I can even find the correct screen to share. There we go. All right, so you all should be seeing a demo environment now for Stack Overflow for Teams, particularly for Stack Overflow Enterprise. Now, as part of this, um, Let's talk about communities. So you're going to have a, a new section on the left side of your interface here called communities, a new navigational component. In fact, it's something that it, inside admin settings, for those of you who might have admin settings, it's something that can actually be turned on and off. So if you were to go into your own instance of the product right now and you don't see it there, uh, it's probably because uh, maybe it hasn't been turned on by an administrator or maybe it's been turned off. Uh, either way, Let's talk about this. Uh, let's run with the example of, say, an ML and AI guild. I'm going to go ahead and click into this. Now, one of the things you're going to notice is that a community is, in very much the same way, similar, similar vibe as collectives, is a collection of tags. So in this case, you can see the variety of tags that are really kind of feeding into this community. Uh, and the idea also is that, like, I stumbled across this community. It looks like the sort of community that I would be a part of. And I can simply come in here and join it. I think the one of the more valuable components, though, when you're thinking about, besides openness, when you're thinking about building a community of practice, is that you want the ability to invite people to it as well. And so as part of that, as someone who has, has permissions, whether you create the community or you're an admin, the ability to actually edit the community, and I can come in here and add people. Actually, Carrie, are you in here? I'm going to go ahead and see if Carrie, ah, Carrie, there you are. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and add you to this, and now I'm going to submit that, and Carrie's now going to get a notification that she's been invited to this community. And so it's really kind of valuable. Again, picture like new hires, new project members, new whatever, uh, that you can now go ahead Ahead and purposefully go ahead and invite them to these communities, which immediately gives them access, or not necessarily access, but visibility in these sorts of things. Additionally, to make this feel more like a community, part of this is understanding things like what's trending, what's hot, right? There's all sorts of things that are being talked about and done, and I want to know kind of what are the hot trends and so forth. You can also get a feed on the right side here of what people are doing. What are the community members doing within Stack Overflow? And you might see topics or things that are being worked on that you might also find valuable. Another thing that stands out to me that, that is really kind of a highlight is also the ability to be able to see members. Now, of course, it's nice because now you can actually see who's part of this. Um, but additionally, people who are subject matter experts in one or more of the defined tags in this community surfaces here too. So one of the advantages that we've been observing is that people get to know their organizations a lot better. Uh, you're starting to truly build a technical community where these people have faces, they have names, and you can identify the people who are also key contributors, people that you might seek out for wisdom or advice or otherwise. And so that's basically communities in a nutshell. Um, they're the one, there's two other pieces that I just want to highlight before I, I, I pause and, and, and check the questions. Hopefully you guys haven't asked anything completely horrible. I'll, I'll go ahead and like put a black mark next to your name. Uh, but the, the, the last two things I want to talk about, one of these is being able to add to a community. So I'm already in this community. If I was to go ahead and like post a question, 
this question here will automatically incorporate these tags. Now, of course, I can remove tags if I wanted to very easily, but it just kind of streamlines that process of asking a tag or a question to a particular community. Uh, the, uh, the last and final thing that I would just bring up here that I think might be worth uh, talking about as I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the Slack integration, which for those of you who use Microsoft Teams, uh, that's okay, the integration works very similarly. But if I was to go directly to the bot, which I am in right now, and I go to create a notification, one of the new things that you're going to observe, and this is another favorite part of mine, is that traditionally you would go ahead and you would indicate specific tags that you want to subscribe to. Uh, now what you can do, if you still have all tags selected, you can actually subscribe to a community, which really kind of streamlines the tag watching aspect. So I can go ahead and pick like I'm a front end developer. I want to subscribe to the front end uh, community. And as part of that, I can just have the bot send me direct messages when new community contributions are taking place. Or I could even have this drop to a specific channel. If you have a channel where these community members typically congregate already, it would be very easy to go ahead and have these notifications from that community sent to that channel as well, which is nice because I, if any of you haven't heard my deep dark secret before, my deep dark secret is I work for Stack Overflow and I don't stare at Stack Overflow all day. And the reality is I've got lots of other things I'm working on. And so how do I stay apprised of what's going on in Stack Overflow or the things that I should be caring about, either I should be consuming or that I should be contributing to? It's through oftentimes through notifications and chat channels or private messages just to myself from the bot. So in any case, that's the end of it. I want to, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I will then turn the time over to those who want to throw questions at me. Yeah, and Jonathan, as as you're you're talking and you're saying, you know, you're not spending all of your time in Stack Overflow. You're working in these other areas. I'm hearing how being in a on a community page helps surface that most relevant information. And so I think it could also speak to how we might um, access Stack Overflow, like might change the way we access instead of going to that questions page, which has everything from all over our organization. Now we can go directly to our communities page and find what's most relevant to our interests. Exactly, exactly. That's great. And I do see a question in chat um, here, which is the that the same are the same notifications avail uh, capabilities available for um, Microsoft Teams as well. The answer is yes. And we got a lot of thumbs up on this question up here. Any thoughts on AI integration? Right uh, earlier, I was kind of joking with with all of you about uh, about the idea of uh, everybody's got like a, a Gen AI. Uh, to, uh, community going on nowadays or something like that. But uh, yeah, any thoughts on the AI integration? Uh, so uh, depending on the context here, I think the number one thing I'll say is that I am like super, super excited about the things that we're doing with AI and Gen AI. I can't really say much more than that today. In fact, um, I don't think I'd be worried about people sending uh, a team of people in dark suits to your house if I told you, but it'd be more so that they send it to my house. Uh, so I have to protect my family in that regard. But otherwise, uh, there are things forthcoming and keep an eye on our blog. Uh, our CEO, Prashant, has gone ahead and posted some things already as kind of a precursor, but we'll continue to keep you updated via our blog. Uh, and for those of you who are customers, I'm sure you'll stay up to date through your account managers, customer success people, and so forth. Yeah, and you can see they've actually, uh, there's a link to that blog post right at that bottom ticker if you want to access that now. Well, that's a fancy little ticker thing there. Yeah. I like that. I, I can't avoid it. Like, uh, my ADD is triggering now. I got to look, stare at the, the, the scrolling banner. But uh, uh, so in any case, um, next question, what's the business case for setting up Stack Overflow Enterprise? Wow, that's a big topic. Um, so in short, uh, I think one of the things that I, I, I kind of talked a bit about earlier within the context of communities of practice, but nonetheless, uh, was some of those key challenges I talked about earlier, like knowledge silos, repeating duplicate effort, uh, all of those uh, distributed teams, productivity, developer happiness. 
those are some key elements of that for sure. Uh, and I and I and I and I think beyond that, I think that the business case is a little bit individualized. Uh, primarily, if you're someone who's thinking to yourself, like, how do I convince my boss to let us have this? Uh, you know, what it really comes down to is how, based on what I've described today, how does Stack Overflow Enterprise and the challenges we solve connect in with key initiatives and goals and so forth that your teams are working on? And that will probably be a huge amount of the impetus and a little bit customized on an organization to organization basis. Also, if it's something that would be helpful, you know, whoever your account team is or whatnot would be happy to help you in thinking that through and, and building out a, a business case as well. Hopefully that was helpful. Is there a member not minimum number of users to make it useful? That is a, actually a very popular question that I get when I'm working with customers because I work with customers of all shapes and sizes. I work with, you know, customers with tens and hundreds of thousands of people, and I work with organizations much smaller than that. And as part of that, this is oftentimes a question that comes up because they're thinking to themselves, "I don't have millions of people like StackOverflow.com. Can this still be successful?" In short, the answer is no. There's not a minimum number, not a hard number where I'd say, like, if you have less than 50 people, this is not going to be helpful. I will say that the more you involve, the better. Uh, more so, if I was to be more specific, think about it this way. You might be in a team of 10 people, 20 people. Maybe if you step it up a level, maybe you're a team of, a, a team of 50 people, right? If you go to like to a director level or something like that. I don't know. But like the question that I would have for you is when you're building a community, does it contain all the right people to help out that core audience? So if I have a team of 10 people or 50 people, um, when I have questions... Are 50% of those questions answerable by that little group of 10 to 50 people? Are 80% of those questions answerable? Because if not, if a lot of times we're leaning on other people like an architecture team or a DevOps team or a platforms or core, core services team or something like that to get our jobs done, then we need to make sure that those people are part of the community too. Because otherwise, if I'm asking questions out into the abyss and the right people aren't there to answer my question, that is what matters most. Not the number of people, but do we have the right people in that community? So hopefully that helps you out. What other common software can communities be used to replace or supplement? Is it a competitor with SharePoint, with Confluence? So I would think of it more this way, that communities is an enhancement to the value that Stack Overflow for Teams is built to do. So if you think about the value that Confluence and SharePoint offer, uh, they're documentation repositories, they're wikis, they're places where we kind of store and share a lot of the internal documentation we use for a variety of purposes. That has a value to the organization. However, if I was to ask you today if everything that a technologist needed within your organization to get their job done was found in documentation, most of you would probably say no that there's a large amount of things that are not documented. They're in the heads of pe they're in the brains of people. They are uh, they're locked into chat channels where people discuss these sorts of things over and over again and don't actually formally document them. Uh, kind of a, a tribal knowledge type of scenario. And so where where communities really comes in is to help enhance the experience of being able to do a better job of collecting and curating a lot of that tribal knowledge, the emergent knowledge that's coming from new projects, new products, new uh, new uh, technologies that you might be implementing. And so that's really where it comes in, is not necessarily to replace those, but to actually help fill in a lot of the gaps that those sorts of solutions don't oftentimes fill. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And what I would also add to that, you know, in just doing our research within the market and, and what 
what are other uh, SaaS vendors doing um, to create this sort of community style feature that um, you know, brings in the knowledge sharing and collaboration aspects. And we really saw a lot of um, uh, other vendors kind of falling into these camps of either, you know, highly focusing on the restricted aspect area. So for example, um, GitHub has GitHub discussions that are, uh, have a lot of these same features, but they are uh, highly restrictive. Um, and so that kind of points back to the, the private teams feature that you mentioned that is uh, specifically siloing information that is more sensitive in nature. Um, and then we saw a lot if there, there was either the restricted access or this more leaning into that social collaborative component. So they were um, things like Slack and discourse and Mattermost that, that were providing channels for conversation, but not necessarily the repository of knowledge um, for sharing. And so I think just building on what you were saying, Jonathan, it what the community feature in Teams really does is put those two together and, and provides open access to the content and an avenue for users to really keep tabs on what's going on with their community. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great point that I completely neglected. Oh, and by the, and, and by the way, you seem to time your comments perfectly when I need a drink of water, so thank you. Perfect. Oh my goodness, someone wrote me a textbook. Um, so they're anonymous for a reason, so I can't go hunt them down. Uh, so uh, I, I already know some options, what communities might be worth uh, creating. Um, I wonder what the suggestion is. Should we only create communities horizontally, i.e. of similar size, or should we feel free to create communities vertically, both smaller and bigger size? In this case, what is the best practices to filter out wrong or trash communities? This is an interesting question. I, I was not actually anticipating a question like this today. So I'm, I'm going to do my best to answer that. And if I fail you in some regard, then you can go ahead and just like, uh, you can yell, yell my name on Twitter or LinkedIn or something like that and say he's the worst. Uh, so uh, when I think about this, about horizontally or vertically, you know, I, I think that the most important thing to me is that, again, with Stack Overflow for Teams, you can potentially have a large community. What Kerry was talking about, Stack Overflow for Teams is to help break down silos across the organization by creating openness of access to knowledge and not having to be a part of this very special chat channel where a lot of other people could value it and I'm not a part of that channel, so I'd never be aware of it, you know, that sort of thing. And so... When we think about like building communities, the purpose is to take, for example, look at the tags that you have in your community today and how like, again, like front end development, there's going to be probably a series of tags inside of there that really kind of all build into a single domain of expertise that could transcend many different teams, projects, products, business units, things like that. And we want to bring those people together to be able to, uh, to, be able to collaborate more effectively, to share their knowledge with each other. Uh, I was working with a customer, it's a, um, a government contractor actually, and as part of their organization, they actually had some of the top Python experts in the world. Like these are like top people on like stackoverflow.com type of people. And, but they were locked into this very niche part of the organization and what they did and what they worked on. And then the question was like, how can we make it so that we form a community with these types of people? Make that so that we're able to benefit from the expertise of individuals like that that are in our organization. And that right there was probably a really good example of what I'm thinking. Uh, and in some cases, maybe it could be more vertical. In some cases, it might be more horizontal. I, I, I'll you leave that up to your discretion. I don't think there's necessarily a best practice one way or another on that, except that making sure that you're creating an area that has a focused domain that people can feel like they're a part of. Yeah, and I, I just, I want to, to go in a little bit deeper on that too. Like, I think one of the, the most important parts is making sure that you're 
aligned with your community on what your purpose and your goal is and, and try to be specific about that. And a lot of the way that we've been looking at communities um, internally to understand then how do we help our customers build these communities. Um, when we've said horizontal or vertical, we've looked at it as um, like the example of um, from that like technical domain of Python or front end that, that would be considered more horizontal because you have a large group from across the organization, even if they're working on different projects or lines of business, they might all be trying to advance their knowledge in the, the Python domain. Um, where something vertical might be around a more specific project like a cloud migration that pulls cross-functionally um, a lot of different people drilling into a specific um, project. And so uh, you can see there's a lot of, of different ways for those communities to be organized. And it's about like what is, um, how is your organization trying to, what are, what are they trying to solve and, and what is your purpose in that? So um, yeah, but well, well said, Jonathan. Is there ability to restrict who can create communities? Uh, in our first release of this, there is not. Uh, it is something where people can openly create communities. Our goal was to make it so that people could quickly and easily uh, be able to establish communities and again, re remove a lot of the barriers and friction and involved in creating those. Uh, however, we, we have already received some feedback from customers who are curious about being able to have a little bit more control and administration over those sorts of things. And so that's taken to, that's definitely being taken to heart, but not at this time. How will communities help with onboarding new team members quickly to Stack Overflow? Uh, this is definitely a really important use case um, where when we think about onboarding new team members, I think, Carrie, you brought up a moment ago, like the topic of like, you might have a project that has a community around it. And uh, as part of that, uh, that might be a really great example where you got a new team member. Sometimes a new team member might be they're new to the company. Sometimes it might mean they've now transferred projects and now they're trying to get up to speed. And now they, and, and as part of that, it's not just like I can now be a part of this fancy, cool community and I can see who's in it and so forth. It's also because that community has been discussing things and they haven't been discussing it in a chat channel where you have to watch it like movie credits scrolling by if you want to actually capture the knowledge. Uh, it's that they've been discussing it in a place where a lot of that knowledge has been shared. The questions, the answers, the articles, and so forth uh, are more archival quality. And they can actually go back and reference what's taken place up to date. They can go and look at the top most upvoted questions and answers and actually see what's going what's happened so far and what's the most valuable things to help them get up to speed uh, not to mention that being a part of that community hopefully they would feel kind of comfortable in asking any net new questions they might have and contributing to that community in a, actually an important way uh, especially if we're talking about the context of a project still like in a project you're going to have all sorts of emergent knowledge, things that just haven't been documented yet because it's not even finalized yet. And so a lot of times it's that Q&A format where a lot of that stuff, that bite-sized knowledge will get kind of documented as you go along. And that can also be valuable. How to promote communities and gain more members. Uh, so, of course, sharing a hyperlink to your community and posting it in channels and advertising it, you're welcome to do that. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that members of a uh, Stack Overflow community will actually, or not necessarily members of a, of a community, but members, people who actually have an account on your Stack Overflow for Teams instance, will receive a, a, a weekly newsletter about communities that are out there, popular communities, growing communities, new communities that could also help to advertise for you. Uh, and that can also be a helpful medium. Uh, and last but not least uh, is just simply like as you encounter people who you think might be a good member of the community, you're welcome to invite them to the community uh, through, uh, again, through how I showed you in the demo. Uh, but those are some of the key ways that that come to mind. Um, I, I would I would really look for and hope for that like this would be uh, maybe in addition to other ways that you might 
currently advertise communities of practice within your organization. Uh, this could include like team meetings or all hands meetings or other things like that, where maybe those would be good venues to bring up and say, hey, we've got a community of practice that each of you can join and here and here's how to be able to find that. My goodness, they're ever coming. Um, so is there an ability to assign uh, another admin to the community so they can edit tags, community name, et cetera? I actually don't think there's a way to do that at a time. I could stand corrected. Uh, so there is an owner or what was what's called a creator of the community. Uh, beyond that, you do have the people with uh, certain levels of permissions. I believe moderators and admins have the ability to also be able to help uh, admin that community as well. Uh, again, this is our first version of the of, of the product and uh, of this feature. And so this is something that we're also uh, working on. Can you embed images, data or videos in the question? Uh, not today. Um, a lot of times the way that people do that today is through linking to those things. So uh, images you can embed. You've always been able to do that on Stack Overflow, the public site, the Teams product, things like that. Uh, that's no problem. Um, embedding data, depending on the form of the data, you could go if it's like data that's like code formatted or whatnot, you can definitely imp input that as well. Videos, not today. Um, these are things that we're, of course, heavily thinking about. Uh, the other thing I would just note is with data, um, one of the things that oftentimes can come up here is accessibility of data or is there PII in that data and so forth. Sometimes it's a best practice that you link to where the data can be found, which will naturally leverage the permissions or, or, or uh or the accessibility structure that you've already established in your organization, rather than worrying about posting data that maybe people, other people shouldn't have access to. Uh, but that's kind of the current state of things. So Daniel, this looks awesome. It would be useful to our current communities of practice. We are, however, on the business tier. Are there any plans to extend access to this functionality? Um, there have been talks about that internally. I don't know how much I can or can't share or what's still accurate there, but I, I think that we've seen that there might be some limited communities fa uh, functionality on the horizon for business, but don't quote me on that. Uh, just uh, just that I, I'm pretty sure I've, I've heard rumor of that internally. I don't know, Carrie, is there anything that you know we can or can't share in that regard? Have I already broken NDA rules? We're going to have to just go ahead and cut this and <laughs> ask it, play the music and send Jonathan off stage. No, I think, I think you, you covered it well. You know, we, the, the feature is incredibly popular. Um, business customers are excited about it. So we are, you know, evaluating what that might look like as a next step, but you know, nothing, nothing in writing or can be promised yet. Is there a standard group of communities of practice we should be looking to begin with? You know what? That's a great question. I do not have an answer to that. Um, you know, I think that as I continue to work with customers in the coming weeks and months, I think that some of the standard groups of communities of practice might start to surface, like, you know, architecture groups and so forth, uh, DevOps. Uh, but like uh, otherwise, uh, not, not, I, apparently, I, I just don't have an answer for that today yet. I, um, I would jump in, um, Heather and, and anyone else who's interested. If you go to the Docs tab, we do have a, a, a commu unlocking communities of practice, um, unlocking value of communities of practice guide in there. It's a PDF. And in the second half of that, it actually goes through, I think it's five or six kind of use cases of um, standard group communities of practice that you could start out with that include like who would be the the people that might be joining like what types of roles and what are some expected outcomes um, and that's where we kind of talk about things like these specialized projects or having a community of practice for your support team um, and uh, for affinity groups and and going into those details so I highly encourage you to um, look into that resource and and get some info there. Yeah, so far, like as you may have saw in the presentation today, we gave you some high level ideas like projects and dom certain domains and so forth. But yeah, what Carrie's saying might be also a good resource as well. Um, do most of your customers stick with the original scope of the Stack Overflow public site, tech questions only, or do you see benefits to expand the scope beyond technical use cases? I, I love, love this question. question. 
I know, right? I'm going to hire this person as a plant and take them on the road. Uh, so uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, what I'll just say is this, and this might come across as rather bold and aggressive and whatnot. I will say that if you're using a private instance of Stack Overflow to only discuss the same types of things you would discuss on the public site, you're missing a huge part of the value. Now, of course, on the public site, like uh, stackoverflow.com, you'll discuss like Python and you'll discuss like frameworks and you'll discuss libraries and so forth. And, and those are still things you can and probably should discuss internally because you're going to have proprietary code. You're going to have libraries and frameworks that you only have within your organization that no one else in the world would be able to help you with. And you'd probably get fired if you posted it on the public site, right? That part's okay. But when we start to talk about all the other things like best practices and architectural decisions and uh, and all sorts of other things that are not necessarily coding related those things can be important even about the tools that you guys use internally or heck as you're talking about here hr business roles at stack overflow internally we have our salespeople use it our people like me marketing people carrie carrie uses it in fact, uh, you know, I think that we we and our we're we're kind of like the example, I guess, of like how that can be used in a, in a wide organization. Um, one of our customers, Microsoft, that I can actually publicly talk about. They've got tens of thousands of users on our platform. Um, salespeople over there use it too. Uh, and think of it this way, though. Usually, when you're low-hanging fruit, it's probably most naturally going to start with your technologists. Your technologists love Stack Overflow already. They like the idea of having Stack Overflow internally. That's easy. But if you start to think about like where it naturally expands out from there, it could be other technologists like QA. QA isn't aren't necessarily developers, but they're technologists and they care about these things and product people and support people. And then if you're if you're an organization, organization that sells a product like Stack Overflow, you have people like me who are solutions engineers who walk the the line between technology and having to talk with engineering and product teams all the time, but also working with customers in a customer facing capacity. And you start and when you get pe people like me involved and I'm like, hey, I've got these salespeople asking me questions about the product all the time. I want them to ask me there so I don't have to answer it again. Just giving you a sense of how that can naturally expand out to uh, reach a broader and broader uh, part of your organization. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a, a great answer. And, and thanks for the great question. Um, was that all the questions? Yeah, well, that's all we have time oh. for today. We are at the top of the hour. So we are going to have to wrap. I know uh, we could probably stay on and talk about this kind of stuff for a long, long time. Um, but in the respect of everyone else's time, uh, we will wrap this up. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for the engagement, um, for the wonderful questions. Don't forget to check out the resources there in the docs tab, and we will be following up with the recording in a few days. And thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone.